<laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Santa Clara University, the Jesuit University in Silicon Valley. I'm Lisa Kloppenberg, Dean of the Law School and Interim Provost-Elect. Santa Clara is in the middle of a capital campaign to raise $1 billion for new endeavors and to better support our students, not only in what they will do and the world they will help create, but in who they will become. Our theme is innovating with a mission, and as a Jesuit university, right at the heart of our mission is the importance of the human person in all her dimensions. The flourishing of all people, and especially those at the margins, is a core concern in our calling to make the world more just and humane. On campus and beyond, human flourishing inspires the work of the Ignatian Center, which is hosting this event, and our other centers of distinction and constituent schools. The depth and breadth of the scholarly insights from Europe, Asia, and the US that we've hosted over the last two days of meetings has been truly impressive. This type of intellectual and intercultural exchange is at the heart of what Santa Clara is about as a Jesuit university in what is the world's largest center of information exchange, Silicon Valley. It's been a delight to partner with the China Forum for Civilizational Dialogue, a project sponsored by Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and La Civilita Catolica in Rome, and the Pontifical Council for Culture. I would especially like to recognize Father Antonio Spadaro, the editor-in-chief of La Civilita Catolica, and an advisor to the Pontifical Council for Culture, Bishop T Paul Tai, one of today's panelists, and the Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture, and Thomas Banchoff, our moderator today, who is the Vice President for Global Engagement at Georgetown University and Professor in the Department of Government and Walsh School of Foreign Service. We all look forward to the panel conversation this evening, but also the new conversation that will emerge from this event and shape our planet's future. Thank you all. Shia Shia. <laughs> now, I'm pleased to turn the program over to Dorian Llewellyn of the Society of Jesus, the executive director of our wonderful Ignatian Center of Jesuit Education. Father Dorian. The latest project of the, of the Ignatian Center is called Tech and the Human Spirit. Uh, it's an exploration of the impact of technology on all aspects of what it is to be human, including the spiritual. Um, our endeavor is not so much about what tech can do or what it should do, but rather who we are and who are we, we are becoming in a tech-shaped world. This is our particular contribution to Santa Clara's universities innovating with a mission. The questions that people ask about human meaning and, the, and human dignity and human rights that are emerging in the wake of technology's advance are urgent, and there is increasing awareness and interest in the many topics. The questions ask for not, they do not ask for quick, easy fixes like a software patch. What they require is thoughtful, wide-ranging conversation with many, many different partners, different perspectives from different contexts. So today, we are delighted to welcome you into what has been an ongoing conversation, the seminar on AI and the human person, Chinese and Western perspectives. So I'd like to welcome to the stage our panelists. You've heard uh, 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 um, Dean Kloppenberg's uh, introduction of uh, Tom Banchoff and also Bishop Paul Tai. Let me tell you a little bit more about, uh, about Dr. Banchoff. Previously, he was the founding director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. He's published widely on religion, ethics, and world politics. Um, over on the far um, end, we have uh, Professor Daniel Bell, who is Dean of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Shandong University. 
Uh, he is the author of the books The China Model and The Spirit of Cities, co-authored with Avner de Chalit. And he's the founding editor of the Princeton China series. Uh, and last year, he was awarded the Huilin Prize and honored as a cultural leader by the World Economic Forum. Um, Next to, uh, uh, next to uh, Tom here is Sorhun Tang. Um, she is professor of philosophy at Singapore Management University. Previously, she taught at the National University of Singapore. Professor Tan is an expert on comparative moral and political philosophy between the Chinese and Western traditions. Her work explores the confluences of Confucianism, du Dewey and pragmatism, and Chinese democracy. Uh, Bishop Paul Tai is the, as we heard, the Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Culture. Uh, he previously served as Secretary of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. He has been a leading figure in recent Vatican efforts to address artificial intelligence and other sociological developments through activities such as the Pontifical Council for Culture's 2017 plenary session, The Future of Humanity, New Challenges to Anthropology. And finally, I welcome my former colleague, uh, Professor Robin Wang, who is uh, Robert H. Taylor Chair in Philosophy and Director of the Asian Pacific Studies Program at Loyola Marymount University. She is a recent Berggruen Fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. Uh, she's a specialist in Chinese thought and its evolution in this age of globalization. Currently, she is working on a project on Chinese philosophy, particularly Taoism, as it relates to the challenges and opportunities posed by artificial intelligence. This is a particularly distinguished panel. Um, I've enjoyed their conversations tr uh, tremendously. Uh, I know that you will too, so please join me in warmly welcoming our distinguished panel. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thank you, Father Dorian, for that warm welcome. Thank you all for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is for us, as was mentioned, the culmination of two days together, intensively discussing some issues which uh, we know will be of interest to our wider societies for many decades to come. So it's an exciting moment. And I thought before, um, launching into the panel discussion and give you a little more context about how we all got here, um, what our topics have been, uh, and what the goals are for this seminar and the wider project of which it's a part. As was mentioned, uh, Georgetown and La Civita Cattolica, two Jesuit institutions, uh, started something called the China Forum for Civilizational Dialogue last year. Uh, this is part of our effort to contribute to dialogue uh, across civilizations on matters of critical importance to humanity. Those of you who know your history, and since we're at a Jesuit institution, I think many will be aware that uh, the Society of Jesus, since the time of Matteo Ricci in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, has been engaged actively in dialogue with China in an effort, of course, to spread the gospel, but also to listen and to learn, to find points of, of commonality in a spirit of mutual respect. And so this project, um, the China Forum, our gathering here today is very much in that spirit. The forum has three topics, um, all designed to identify areas of commonality between China uh, and the world, uh, areas that are, of course, political, because we can't avoid that, but really have a strong cultural and societal dimension, and therefore are open to constructive engagement uh, and communication. One of the topics is the future of humanities education, uh, which is a concern uh, around the world as we move into more technological society. Another is the future of ecological civilization. We've had uh, interesting dialogues on that, obviously a critical issue in light of the threat of climate change. Uh, and the third, as you know, is uh, AI uh, with a focus on the human person. Uh, and what we've done is engage this topic not so much as AI experts, but as scholars of different religious and philosophical traditions trying to come to terms with these emergent challenges, challenges we're all familiar with, revolutions in machine learning that are ongoing, 
uh, the ability of, of machines to manipulate words, data, and images. Um, implications, of course, for all kinds of sectors of our society, transportation, communications, business law, medicine, you name it. Um, we're not going to tackle, we haven't tried to tackle all of that. Given where we're coming from, given our disciplinary backgrounds, we want to focus in, zero in on this question of the human person. What does the growing presence of machine-human interaction across all of these domains, what does it mean for how we think of ourselves as human beings and how we relate to other human beings? I don't have to tell you that uh, we're going through a, a transformation where if you look around here on campus, obviously, at the dinner table, public transportation, people are fully immersed more than ever with their digital assistants, uh, with their cell phones. They are interacting in a more uh, individualized, personalized way, thanks to AI, which is shaping our view of what reality is, reacting to our needs and preferences, and also shaping those preferences in turn. It's partly that interaction which raises interesting philosophical, ethical, and moral questions. Uh, but it's partly also just the fact of that interaction and the time that we're spending, not in face-to-face -face interaction with other human beings, uh, but with our digital worlds. Uh, it's probably not going to change, so it's a good opportunity to think about not just the challenges that this poses to our traditional understanding of the human person, but maybe in an optimistic vein, some of the ways in which these new technologies can reinforce and strengthen uh, some of the wisdom across the traditions about what a human person is. And of course, there are many different points of view. You'll be hearing some of them. But one of the things that came out of our discussion so far, and I hope you'll see this as a theme uh, here uh, on the panel, is a certain degree of, if not commonality, convergence around a certain idea of the human person. Not the human person uh, that we're familiar with from our wider culture, the world of technology and business with its focus on the individual, the autonomous individual, rational, making choices, determining his or own, her own future. An idea of a human person which resonates particularly in the United States, but of course has spread around the world. What we find in Catholic social thought, but as you'll hear also in Confucianism and in other traditions, is much more a focus on the relational. The idea that you can't even think the individual without thinking and understanding and appreciating the bonds of codependence, of relationality that we're born into, and that imply not just freedoms, but also duties and responsibilities. So that's one theme that has emerged. Another theme that we focused on is the importance of the body and our embodied nature as human beings. Again, you'll see understood in different ways across traditions between um, Christianity and, and Chinese philosophy, uh, but fundamentally a skepticism uh, of the notion that there's the mind and then there's the body, um, that you can engage with people in the same way across distances, uh, digitally or in virtual worlds, there's a sense, I think, within our traditions, which of course developed without these technologies in worlds that were, uh, of course, interpersonal in a very physical sense, that the body and our physical selves um, are critical in thinking about the sense of what it is to be a human person and the implications of these technologies for our changing relationships with ourselves and with others. So I wanted to preview for you a little bit some of the themes we'll be touching on, give you a sense of the conversation we have touched on other things, and there'll be plenty of time for conversation with you, but we wanted to provide a, a unique space to look at some issues, not as AI experts, but as people embedded in these traditions, concerned about, hopeful about, but also concerned about the trajectory uh, of these technologies in, in our world. So with that, I'm going to hold back. Uh, each of the speakers will uh, maybe say a little bit more about their background and interest in the topic and then speak for maybe five to seven minutes with some reflections. Um, I'm not going to preview any more, but give them a chance to lay out some of their ideas. Then we'll have a short conversation here on the panel, and we'll open it up to you. And stick around to the end, because we have a reception as well. Okay, It's Friday afternoon. All right. 
With that, I want to hand it over to my colleague, Sir Hun. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, well, I'm very new to this uh, topic of AI, but I consider it an important uh, issue for um, certainly people interested in Confucianism, whether political philosophy or ethics, uh, to grapple with. So what I'm going to share are just some questions and concerns because I haven't done enough serious research to have any kind of definitive uh, thesis to defend or to present to you. So I'll start with uh, the contrast that uh, Tom has already touched on, which is uh, the different views of the human person. Right? So AI has made tremendous progress on the basis of a certain view of human thinking and acting that privileges uh, autonomy and reason. Uh, as conceived by uh, the conceived uh, in the uh, European Enlightenment, right? Um, this uh, particular model of human reasoning and autonomy is one that basically drives a wedge between reason and on the one hand and feelings and emotion on the other, as well as between mind and body. But this kind of dualism and accompanying neglect of uh, feelings and the body uh, is not shared by the Confucian tradition. For Confucians, the human person is fundamentally relational. This doesn't just mean that relationships uh, are important to us. It actually means that there is no human person without human relations. The human relations actually constitute our persons. So um, the human, um, human uh, person is not uh, born as a complete human person. Uh, for Confucians, the human person has to be cultivated. So the self-cultivation that produces the ideal human person uh, is one that cannot uh, omit the body. So self-cultivation is at the same time cultivation of the body. Right? So the person and the body are not separate. The person is always embodied. So this already gives a very um, different understanding of what it would mean to actually think and act like a human being. So the, it immediately raises some skepticism of whether it's possible for AI to ever think and act like human beings from the Confucian perspective of the human person. Okay, or at least um, some pretty drastic modification to the approach and their model of the human person would have to take place before Confucians would be willing to admit that AI can uh, think and act like a human person. Now, um, the kind of model that AI uh, operates on may not matter so much even to Confucians, insofar as AI is limited to the kind of domains where we are basically looking for um, a new and better ways of meeting functional goals. right? Because all these functional goals, how to uh, achieve them, uh, could be done better by AI right, through algorithms. But because of um, the different view of human persons uh, in Confucianism, their view of human relationship is also very different. So when AI uh, enters the kind of domain where human interactions uh, is of primary importance, for example, in education, right? The, relation, the interaction between teacher and student is uh, absolutely important to the achievement of educational goals. Or in the domain of elder care, for example, right? Where the caring relation, again, the human interaction is very important. And if that's the case, then what is um, distinctively human about human interactions? Is it just a matter of meeting certain uh, needs or certain desires right? um, that the person being educated or the person being cared for has? Right? Is meeting these kinds of needs and desires something that can be uh, met through uh, some kind of algorithm? From the Confucian perspective, uh, that's not possible. Simply because what is really human about these interactions, uh, there are two components. One is empathy and one is reciprocity. And when it comes to empathy, the understanding of empathy is, it is a kind of emotion, and it's the kind of emotion that has a embodied uh, aspect. So that the biological substrate, the kind of organism that we are, right, that operates in a certain kind of uh, natural as well as social environment, uh, is absolutely crucial to developing that kind of empathy. So in so far as AI cannot have our kind of experience, the kind of experience of uh, human beings, right? because they don't have the same kind of biological sub substrate. Um, it would be a problem to expect AI to have that kind of empathy. And reciprocity, again, is dependent on, um, it's between human beings with comparable experience. Because of the kind of biological organism that they are, and because of their shared environment, right? they have comparable experience, never exactly the same, 
but comparable in the way that we could empathize with the other. Right? And the reciprocity involves paying attention to the particularity of the other person as well as uh, responding to them through one's own particularity. Right? So these are some of the, uh, I think, concerns that Confucians would have uh, and um, would like to see not so much that they will resist any more progress in AI, but rather would like to see the development of AI uh, perhaps um, shifting in this direction or at least broadening its uh, attention to what needs to, to be factored in in terms of the next stage of progress. Thank you, Paul. Great. Um, I'd just like to say, I want to share a few ideas that are coming. This is an area, AI, which has extraordinary potential for our future, and also we're becoming aware of certain risks. And I think the church is concerned to reflect on it, to think about it, but it's an emerging reflection. There are no definitive church teachings in this area yet. I think we need to, be, we need to study, understand what's happening, and engage, because this is going to be a truly a global issue. It's not an issue just for one church or for one ethical tradition or one culture. And that's one of the challenges because the work in the area of AI is happening across the globe. And even where it's happening locally, it tends to be globalized workforces who are coming together to do that. So there's different value systems, different approaches at play. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting challenge for us. My interest first is as somebody who taught about ethics, ethics and thought ethics for many years, I think I'm delighted to see the currency of the word ethics is back. People are talking about it and are concerned about it. And that's for me positive. I think one thing we have to be very careful as maybe people who are professional ethicists or who have worked in that area is that we don't disempower the people who are at the center of the development, the people who are doing the work, the people who really know the technologies, that we can help them, but we can't allow them to outsource the ethics. They're the ones who understand the issues. They're the ones who will be making the decisions. They're the ones who I think we can help to reflect more critically and offer them a vocabulary and offer them systems that will help them to think ethically. But I think we have to be careful not to be involved in any form of disempowering. I think I welcome, as you read all over the place, there's different projects which will all put human at the center, you know, ethics, we want our AI to be human-centered at the service of humanity. We want it to be person-centered. We want it to be for good. I think that's very welcome. I think people who work in the area of ethics will be very conscious that it's easier to name the criteria of being human than it is to fully work out and understand what it is to be human and what it is that makes human life worthwhile, and that that has been expressed differently in different cultures. So we have to be much more attentive of that. However, I remain convinced that our own Catholic Christian ethical tradition, which says that one way of reflecting and thinking about ethical issues is to ask the question, what are the values and what are the ideas and what are the approaches that will encourage and help human beings to flourish as individuals and in society? What will be the impact of the type of decisions we may be making on the long-term future of human beings and thinking of human beings not just as isolated individuals but as people who live in community together. I think that tradition which we have called it down the natural moral law tradition which is based on a conviction that there is something distinctive and given about being human that is worth encouraging has, can be a starting point. I mean it's not without its problems and it needs to be nuanced because we have to do this in a more globalized capacity. I think in that context too, I think sometimes it's easier in a, within our Western tradition at least to start with human rights. Human rights in a sense are articulations of things that we see that are intrinsic and important to human dignity, to the value and worth of human people that enable people to flourish when they live together in society. So I think there's rich ground there to work together. I think as an ethicist, I want to say one th thing that I want to watch sometimes, I think we have to watch sometimes when we're thinking about ethics, there's a, an ethical theory which is kind of about more utilitarian or consequentialist, which says we try and see the consequences of what we do and we measure the consequences. And I think it looks robustly scientific. But those of us who have maybe studied or have the opportunity of studying more philosophically know the limitations of such a system, that 
not all consequences are the same. Not all consequences are predictable. So that approach isn't necessarily the only way of doing ethics. I think it has much to teach us and much to contribute, but be careful of just going with that one approach, particularly because it looks scientific and it may be a first starting point. I think also we need to ask questions about, which are about virtue ethics and are about conscience. What sort of person do I want to be? I am making certain choices in my work that have consequences, but they also affect who I am. They shape the type of person I am. And I think one of the more interesting ethical developments has been where people as individuals have refused to do certain type of research, even though their refusal to do it may have a cost for them, may not be overly effective insofar as other people will come along and fill those jobs. But I think it serves as a warning and an invitation to us to think more ethically. From a Catholic perspective, just I think these are just very tentative insights I'd want to offer that I think from our tradition are important. One is, as a Catholic tradition, we've often studied with reconciling well the idea that as human beings we are mind and body. We've, we've suffered sometimes from a more dualistic approach, and that's not unique to us. I think we have to watch in some of the advanced thinking or the limit thinking, thinking about the future of humanity and the singularity and moving on to, there's a slight tendency at times to think that the distinctively and uniquely human is our rational capacity, is our mind, and maybe not giving enough attentiveness to what it is to be bodily. And particularly as contemporary science will show us the bodily and material functions are at the basis of many of our, what we would have thought more our conscious activities. Um, related to that, just reiterate the importance of, science, of the social dimension. Pope Francis, in his first tentative effort to address this, his letter is called On Human Community. That we, human community, we are not isolated individuals who make a compromise to find a way of living together socially. We are, we are born into communities, we're born into families, we are social in our essence, and we have to keep that alive something about the dignity of all human beings. Then finally, just a, a, a tendency at times, when we think and talk about technology, our Catholic tradition has wanted to say and celebrate the goodness of technology and science, the gifts it has brought to us in so many ways. We've also been aware of sometimes what we call the dual use. We, you know, we can use technology for good, we can use it for bad. I see emerging recently a thing that says, but technology isn't always just neutral. Technology, in particular the products or applications of technology and science, tend to be developed within certain value systems. They're developed within a, an economic and political context where that may determine how they play out. So in an environment where the emphasis is on competition, being the first to get there, being the ones to maximize the profit, that can affect how the technologies are developed and how they, so they're not quite as neutral as we might want. One other thing that I would just think is important is that we live in a world that's already marked by gross inequalities. The risk that the development of AI, by concentrating wealth in increasingly fewer hands, could exacerbate those inequalities, not just economically, but also democratically. Who will have the bigger say? Because we can shop for jurisdictions, we can lobby, we can have power. And even almost a final question of, we tend to talk about in the Christian tradition, creation, God made human beings in his own image and likeness. As human beings begin to create artificial intelligence, whose images and likenesses will be prioritized? Whose notion of what it is to be human will dominate? And how do we ensure that there is an inclusive approach to looking at these? Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Robin Wang. I'm from Loyola Marymount University. And uh, we will see it's University of Silicon Beach. This is our president trying branding our university. <laughs> but I, I'm supposed to bring into Taoist perspective into this dialogue. Um, Taoism is less taught or less researched in academic, academic field, but very much into the popular culture. If people have never been to China, they think about the Chinese culture usually is Great Wall, Kung Fu and the Kung Pao chicken. <laughs> so, right, so, so therefore, but do you know actually Kung Fu and uh, uh, culinary arts, some words are very much rooted in Taoist teaching. 
So I will quickly I will see Taoism uh, is a, na a nature inspired practice and uh, uh, theory and the practice. So nature gave them inspirations to for human beings to um, uh, emulate. So. In terms of AI, in, when we look at the Taoist perspective into AI, so I'm asking the question, can machine flow like Tao? Okay, this is my question. Why I'm asking this question? Then because this is, instead, we're not thinking about, just like father talking about the human beings is a, is a thinking being. But for Taoist ideas, Every existence, including human beings, is a qi flow beings. Qi is energy, right? So, um, so therefore, in this kind of sort, you are not really uh, eating a food, but rather you are eating a qi. Are you taking the qi? And the qi can be quantified. And so, therefore, you know, in a certain way, machine can flow like a because it's machine is can flow like chi. There is a chi flowing. However, so um, because in the in Chinese history, Tao is the practitioner is like a chi engineering because they understand the body in the twelve chi channels called the Jing Lu. So, um, however, so this is only one simple quick readings. But then, if we Deep reading Taoist view, thinking about the human beings. Human beings are much more and also beyond a qi, just the simple qi flow. Because human beings consist of three elements. One is the physical forms. It's male, female, these biological forms. Secondly, we talk about this is a qi, it's energy flow. But the third is a spirit, it's a shen. So this is spirit, this is shen, it's translated, you can see, uh, mystical force, um, the power. Okay. So in this kind of situation, so then we're looking about the shen from three different uh, aspects. So we can see shen, it's uh, uh, clarity, shen ming, to, you see things with the perspective, very clear. And then, uh, Second, we see shen qi is all your embodiment, this qi, your character. And then also shen ling, shen ling is the shen spirit. When you die, you have a two types of spirit, hun and the po. So this is a um, basic Taoist view to think about the human beings. It's not dualistic but rather from a more complicated way to capture the human existence. Now, come to the AI. So what do we should do about the AI then? There's two distinctions needed to make. So one distinction will be natural intelligence and artificial stupidity. So the idea is we always embodied a certain kind of inborn nature. And this inborn nature, we need to preserve it. But we should not use our stupidity, fake intelligence, destroy our inborn nature. So this is very um, classical text that always talk about very much how can we you know, make our effort to preserve our gen, uh, generant inborn nature. So make a distinction between what is a human nature and what is a heavenly nature. And do not use the heavenly nature into, and uh, um, do not use the human nature to interfere heavenly nature. So this is one a distinction. And then secondly, following that a distinction, building on that a distinction, then we see what is our ultimate, con ultimate pursuit. So ultimate pursuit is to pursue in generous children, you know, so, so authenticity loosely translate. This is not, and then not simply satisfying human desire. So human desire is, in many cases, is dangerous destructive. So um, in, this, in this kind of um, uh, distinctions, we can't have our pursuit 
but then the pursuit, the purpose of the pursuit to become generally the person, which is Zen Ren in Taoist uh, pursuit, not just uh, simply satisfy the, all your artificial uh, wants and uh, desires. So I think this uh, is the uh, um, way, you know, um, Taoist, uh, uh, a, a Taoist uh, a perspective on this AI issue. Another thing that I think maybe a Taoist perspective can make contributions to artificial intelligence AI field, which I call the, call the yin yang intelligence, where you probably know the yin yang symbols, half black, half white. And then most important thing is yin yang symbol. It's, this is not a circle, it's a floating S. So you are making uh, adaptive uh, choices and you, you see yourself how to, uh, the, not just yourself, but also AI to can make alignment with uh, your environment, with the situation. Okay, so I'm, that's all. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so thank you, I've participated in dialogues the past couple of days, it's been fascinating. And I think there's, we sh pretty much we agree that AI can be good or bad. Um, so we really have to think about what standards we should use to evaluate whether AI uh, can be used for desirable purposes or not. And the Chinese traditions, I think, have a lot to offer. Um, but before I begin, I just want to ask a question to everybody here. Um, I want you to imagine a future 50 years from now, a very wealthy society, all our basic needs are met, um, and advanced machinery would do all the socially necessary work that we wouldn't otherwise want to do. Boring, repetitive, dirty labor. Advanced machinery would do all that work, and then we would be free to develop our creative talents. How many of you think of that as a positive a vision of the future? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so most people here are communists. <laughs> because what I describe is Karl Marx's vision of a higher communist society. So the word communist sounds kind of bad uh, because it's been misused you know, in, in much of the world over the past hundred years. But Karl Marx had a very beautiful vision of the future, which is the one that I just described, where human beings are free to develop their creative talents because advanced machinery does a socially necessary work. Um, and at the time, it sounded quite utopian, but now, with the development of AI, it is a possible future that we can imagine, right? We can imagine a future where AI does the work that we wouldn't otherwise want to do, the boring, repetitive, uh, and, and dangerous forms of labor, and then all humans would be free to develop our capacity for creative work, which not everybody has as deep need, but at least, among many of us, right, in the university and sectors, for example, we do think that a good kind of form of life is one that involves the capacity for creative work. So here's a good standard to judge what's positive and what's negative about AI. If AI can help us move towards this future where we, are, we have free time and resources that allow us to develop our capacity for creative work, then it's good. If it inhibits that, capacity for creative work, then it's bad. So the Marxist tradition in China is, is coming back, and, it, and it's not necessarily a, a bad thing if it helps us to think about AI in this way. Um, my colleagues have already described the Confucian tradition, which offers a somewhat contrasting or maybe complementary vision of the good life. I mean, for Confucians, as was just mentioned, the good life lies in our relations with other people, starting with our family members and extending to other people. And if AI can help us to nourish uh, our, those relations with, 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 with family members and with other members of society, with our intimates, um, and with strangers too, uh, and with animals and with the natural world, if, they could, if AI helps us to nourish harmonious social relations, then it should be encouraged. But if AI hinders that capacity, then it should be discouraged. So again, it's a simple idea that what standards should we use to evaluate whether AI is a good or bad thing? I think both the Marxist and the Confucian traditions provide helpful answers. For the Marxist tradition, it's positive if it helps us to free us 
from the need to engage in unwanted labor and gives us free time and resources to develop our capacity for creative work. And for Confucians, it's good if it helps us to nourish our, our valued social ties and promote harmonious social relations in family at large. And there's lots of examples that we can use to develop these ideas. Um, I think uh, our moderator will push us in that direction. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. So um, you've gotten a taste of the conversation, which, by the way, over the last day and a half has involved about a dozen colleagues who are here today and who may jump in when we get to questions and answers. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to give a couple specific examples um, of technologies that are emerging, driven by AI, that um, challenge us in traditional areas uh, of life across our societies, and focus first on the process of education. The value of education, of self-cultivation, um, Sorhun mentioned it in the Confucian tradition, not just as accumulation of knowledge, but uh, a moral education, and in Christian tradition we sometimes talk about formation. How is that educational enterprise already being transformed, will be transformed by the evolution of new technologies? I'm thinking here in particular of personalized AI tutors, which uh, are already being developed at different levels of, of education, and one could argue um, are a very positive development because uh, by observing the student in real time, understanding where they're struggling, uh, obviously evaluating their accumulation of knowledge, but also reading their emotional responses to the material, uh, such tutors, not necessarily now, but in the future, will be able to customize the educational experience, provide encouragement. One could even argue, and this is maybe a bit of a stretch, that on the moral side, um, the use of multimedia and narratives and stories uh, and challenging students to think through those stories, what it means to be human, um, that machines also might be in a position to, again, through their direct understanding and through their reading of the signals from an individual, to provide a kind of moral education as well. Uh, what are the positive aspects of such a development, but also what are some of the negative aspects of such a development from the point of view, say, of the Confucian, Christian, and Taoist traditions. So maybe, Sir Hun, you could start. Uh, well, my institution is very much into technology-enhanced education. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. For example, when you have blended learning, it enables students to learn at their own pace, right? They are not just trapped in the classroom where they either get it or they don't when you lecture and things like that. Um, but I think here there's uh, also a limit in the sense that um, we should think of AI as complementary aids rather than competitive, right? I don't think we have quite got to the stage where we can just uh, have AI as personalized tutor and we do away with all teachers, all human teachers. Uh, the reason being this, in the sense that even if you can monitor every aspect of a student, right, uh, their reaction to uh, um, uh, cause content, uh, to see whether they are actually progressing in their understanding or accumulation of knowledge, etc., etc. The number of parameters that are relevant uh, is potentially infinite. And which of these uh, uh, facts or things that you're monitoring about the students uh, is relevant in terms of uh, what you need to do to help the students progress um, may be difficult to translate or be handled by an algorithm. Right? Now, of course, with the kind of processing power that AI has, it could deal with millions of parameters at the same time. Uh, but it's actually still not very reliable. It is prone to wild mistakes, okay? even in areas where it seems to have achieved a great deal of um, uh, success in terms of accuracy, for example, face recognition. Right? It, its accuracy is much higher than human ability to recognize images. But when it does go wrong, when it does make a mistake, the mistakes are totally inexplicable and wildly off, right? Um, so, so, but that may be just a matter of the state of the technology. But I do think that um, in terms of the education process, when we, um, when we aim for what we call transformative uh, education, for example, right? When, when does a student actually achieve that kind of transformation? It's not so much to do with the cost content or even uh, how, uh, how well you monitor their progress. 
It's really to do with the teacher's ability to connect with the student at the level where your attention to their particular personality, their circumstances, pick out the appropriate relevant factors about them. And what you picked out as relevant is as much dependent on your own particular experience as a teacher, right? your own past experience, your own personality, which means different teachers encountering the same students uh, will find different things appropriate. Right? So the transformation that result, in fact, will be different because when you have a different pairing, okay, the same student, different teachers, the trans transformative result is different. Different students, same teacher, you also have different transformative results. Right? And this is the kind of flexibility and uh, uniqueness, if you like, to the transformative process that I think um, in so far as algorithm, uh, the, in so far as AI is limited to algorithmic uh, systems, uh, cannot really achieve. Thank you. Other thoughts? Paul? I think in our discussions when we talked about this, somebody made a distinction that I thought was very helpful where they said maybe AI could be there for the instructional dimension and, and that teaching or education in the broader sense is something more than just the passing on of knowledge and being able to help mm -hmm. a person to evaluate. I think in the older notion of education, it's also about the person who can draw out of the person. And it's, I, for me, maybe I'm stuck with magical thinking, but I like to think really good teaching is also involving an interaction of two people. Um, I taught for many years in a teacher training college. And we were training people to be teachers and evaluating them as teachers. <laughs> and I actually became very kind of, some were born to be teachers, others were not going to be teachers. And sorry to say that, but <laughs> it's one of the reasons I gave up working in that college, because I just couldn't believe that we were actually forming teachers. I suppose the other thing I will say on the education thing, I do think we do need to look at it educationally, though, is already, before we get near AI, the volume of information that young people, and not just young, have at their fingertips means that the role of the teacher is not so much any longer to be the dispenser or the gatekeeper of knowledge, but is to be the guide and the mentor. That, and above all, we need to teach people that sense of judgment and methods of judgment. And I mm -hmm. think that's, I think there are far more important human tasks we need to get right about education first. That would be my own instinct. So I actually, in the discussion, um, I made a distinction between instructor and the teacher. Instruction and the teaching. So I think AI doing the best, very effectively instructing someone, give someone, you know, in, input, then probably output. So it's, it's good to give you the directions, but um, it's efficient, the instructor, but the lousy teacher. So the, why are we seeing that because the teaching required much more than simply instruction? Because the teaching is a mutually um, learning experience, teachers and the student. Let's take the martial arts. Let's take a, you know, it's a, how Tao is the teaching in a, a work is masters and the disciples. It's a, they are not just a transmitting skill, but they're also transforming heart and mind, right? So in the one hand, if you uh, remember uh, Karate Kid and uh, the new one, so I was a cultural uh, consultant for that film. So you can see uh, Jack, Jackie Chen is teaching Jay to learning all these fancy Kung Fu moves, but at the same time, Jay actually transformed Jackie Chen, in other words, Jake helped Jackie Chen realize his own weakness. That means a student help a teacher to transform. So in this kind, in this kind of set, in this kind of context, I don't think AI can do so. Yeah, I mean, teaching is not just the transmission of information. That's the, it's really important to remember, as was said, it involves an emotional connection between teacher and student, and the teacher sets a positive example, ideally, to the student. Um, I mean, just think of, if I think of my, my favorite teachers in, in primary school, in secondary school, in university, I can remember 
which ones I liked and which ones I didn't like, but I cannot remember what information they transmitted, right? Um, I mean, it's like reading a novel. I can remember if I liked the novel, but I can't really remember the, the plot, right? So, so that's, it's key to remember that you know, AI, and AI is ultimately more about transmitting information and it can't replace this important role of, of the teacher. So yeah, of course AI can complement um, the role of teaching, but it should never replace. That said, it's worth keeping in mind that this is the, the ideal model of teaching is small class, small interaction between teacher and student, maybe complemented by AI, but that's also very expensive, right? I mean, think of liberal arts education in the US. I mean, it's very expensive, and most of the world doesn't have the luxury to do that. So, so maybe AI can be very helpful, like as a second best possibility for very poor uh, places, you know, that where you can't afford small classes, um, and maybe their AI can have and should have a more prominent role uh, in in the educational system. Yeah. Great. I, mean, I, I just think of my university, Shandong University, which is a very good university, but we can't afford small classes much of the time. It's just unfortunate. I'm Dean, I want to encourage you. We just don't have the resources. So, yeah. So maybe before opening it up, one more uh, concrete example of an emerging technology which is raising issues that have to do with human-machine interaction. I'm thinking of something, uh, so Hoon mentioned um, elderly care where one could argue that um, the evolution of smart robots that attend to physical needs, perhaps, uh, around the house or around the apartment, but also increasingly become conversation partners uh, that personalize their interaction with, with an elderly person, uh, maybe in the absence of, of human beings to provide that care. What, what do you see against the background of your traditions as the the positive uh, developments there, the potentials, but also some of the, the dangers for the human person. So, uh, uh. I think um, in older societies, uh, when people grow old and if they actually need care, let's say they lose some of their functionalities, there is no option other than uh, their family members taking care of them. But in modern living, we are already dependent on a lot of external help, right? They are, in fact, there's a huge demand for care professionals. Uh, both institutionalized but also home care kind of uh, care professionals. So in so far as this has become almost an inevitable need, right? Um, I think AI has a lot of potential to relieve some of the pressure on certain societies where there's a huge labor shortage. So there's a, a shortage of uh, care professionals who are needed. Uh, but I, from the Confucian perspective, I would be again concerned about whether we are aging from um, using AI as a complementary aid into uh, allowing it to become a competitive uh, kind of uh, option in the sense that it might be too easy for I mean, children, for example, right, uh, to see it as an easy substitute uh, instead of themselves caring for their parents. Right? That's not to say that uh, Children are necessarily the best carers, right? We are all imperfect. And sometimes children, no matter how much they love their parents, they don't do the care, caring very well. So to the extent, help is always uh, appreciated and should be appreciated. But I think one should not underestimate the need for that. Uh, that nevertheless, the need to actually do whatever you can in terms of uh, certainly fulfilling your filial responsibility in the sense that it matters both to the children because it's part of, for Confucians at least, it's part of their own personal growth. That no matter how inadequate they might be as uh, carers, uh, the effort right, makes a difference. And I think even from the parents' perspective, sometimes it's not so much that you want the perfect care in terms of someone who can make you comfortable, take care of your physical need in the most perfect way possible, but rather it's the companionship, right? Because they are your children, you have a certain interest in them. You want to hear about what's going on in their life. You want them to share with you their joys, their, their frustrations, their uh, troubles, etc., etc. Right? Because maintaining that bond uh, is much more important than to them sometimes, even than having their physical needs uh, cared for. Right? So there again, I think, as complementary uh, um, AI, AI is good. As competitive uh, option, I would say we have to be careful there. Daniel, on the Confucian tradition, um, would you add anything? Well, um, 
there's, I, I have a very similar view, but just to illustrate it with, with a concrete case, I mean, in, especially in East Asia, there's a, many cute robots are being developed for purposes of caring for elderly parents, and that's good if it could complement the normal caring functions that adult children would, would have towards their elderly parents. But there's a risk that is very, actually, not just purely hypothetical, that the elderly parents would become more attached to the cute robots than to their own children. And, and so we need to combat that risk. So if it were a matter of policy in an East Asian study that values field piety, I, I would favor designing ugly robots that <laughs> decrease the likelihood uh, that, they, that they would replace the love of, between children and elderly parents. Okay, well, we've got um, a half an hour uh, for questions and answers, to, which Father Dorian will guide from the, the podium. Thank you. Uh, so on my bedside table is a book called The Idiot's Guide to AI, um, <laughs> and I need it. Um, it says this, that an informal definition of an algorithm could be a set of rules that precisely defines a sequence of operations, which generally includes all computer programs, and says generally a program is only an algorithm if it stops eventually. So in your questions, I'd like you to be an algorithm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, which is to say that in order to have a chi-like flow in our uh, conversation, uh, could you please ask a question? And politely, I'm asking you to ask it concisely so that everybody else can, can we can enrich the conversation with many voices. So I'm going to do, I'm put my teacher's hat on, <laughs> first of all, thank you. And I'm going to ask you to pause for, um, let's say, one minute in silence as you begin to formulate your question. Thank you very much. We'll uh, take the mic. We'll bring you a mic. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, my name is Irina Raiko. I'm the director of the Internet Ethics Program at the Markala Center for Applied Ethics here on campus. And I was struck by the conversation around education in particular because today, uh, tech ethicists were having an interesting conversation on Twitter about the deployment of AI in some schools in China where they're using facial recognition and emotion recognition and the revulsion of the students against this and them having no choice. So I wanted to ask, you, you know, you, you were very modest in talking about how you don't want to posit sort of an ideal model of teaching that doesn't really exist. But don't we have to be careful to not posit an ideal model of AI that doesn't exist also? Thank you. Daniel, why don't you get us started? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, to be frank, I don't know enough about this case to comment. Um, but I guess you're, you're, you're suggesting that we should avoid uses of AI in educational settings that lead to negative consequences, right? I think I'm suggesting that the, the sort of the impression that was given was of this AI that would be very effective, right. sensitive, mm -hmm. um, and that right now when they're deploying it, as, as far from that model as the you know, teaching is from the ideal model. Sure. I mean, I could just think how, I mean, I could just abstractly, you know, facial recognition in classrooms, just it can be put to use to, for good or bad purposes. I mean, if it's um, put to use uh, to capture people who are sleeping um, during the talks, for example, um, that might 
That might be a, a, a good, although they have jet lag, so this is perfectly <laughs> understandable. <laughs> um, it, it, but, you know, it, seriously, if, it, if there's students who consistently fall asleep in class, I mean, and, and this, is, this might be a good way of alerting the teacher to a problem, right? I mean, that's not something, something wrong with that. Um, but if it's put to use for, I mean, for purposes of, um, I, I, of, 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 for a negative purpose, I mean, wh in what way is it negative in this, in this case? Um, in the ways that surveillance societies destroy intellectual freedom and creativity and everything that comes from feeling like you're watched all the time and that decisions would be made about you based on algorithms that are often completely wrong, as you were saying, sometimes just wildly inaccurate and Sure. I mean, if, if it leads to misjudgments and, 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 and takes away people's creativity, obviously it's a bad thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this right to the back there. Hi, I'm Jeff Clabin. I teach in the engineering law and business school here at Santa Clara. I was intrigued by the discussion on the difference between instruction and teaching, you know, interactive, experiential. Um, if I want to design a new course, which we've been experimenting with, um, to focus on the latter, what models would you point towards? If I proposed a new uh, syllabus that was purely based on interaction without much instruction, that probably wouldn't fly well here. But just your thoughts on what hurdles to overcome and how to move in that direction. I guess you have to start with what's your course objective, right? I mean, what are you actually trying to teach? Then how much of it should be instructional and how much of it should be more than just instructional? Because usually uh, for any kind of course, there is a certain element that is instructional. Uh, because for one thing, there has to be some content and you need to consider the best way to deliver that content. And some of these methods of delivery might just be instructional. But beyond that, I think uh, for any kind of courses that go beyond just that kind of uh, basic instruction would be where you enter into uh, the kind of um, pedagogy where it requires much more doing. The students need to learn by doing. And in learning by doing, this is where you can, you, you can no longer just rely on instruction. Because when you allow your students to learn something through doing, you have to be prepared for the unexpected. You have to expect that each of them will do whatever you, you set a kind of a rough activity and say, okay, you are supposed to do this. And you have in mind they are supposed to learn something. But when they start doing what you tell them to do, they will all do it in their own way. And they will not necessarily end up what you think they are going to learn. In fact, they may show you something about what you thought you want to teach them. But in fact, you yourself did not understand it fully. Because through that, there are different ways of trying to carry out your, um, your instructions in a way. They open up new vistas, right? So they learn, but you also learn through what they are learning, right? So this is the part where then the interactivity in terms of teaching, where you as a teacher with a particular kind of experience, but also your own particular limitations, right? Encounter the student as a particular kind of learner, right? Uh, doing a certain kind of activity. Uh, and then the process is transformative for both parties, I think. I don't know. Okay. And I also see uh, research has shows students really learn from teachers they love. Mm -hmm. So that's it's really, you know, it's data dri uh, driven uh, research has shown this. So I'm not sure, of course, and engineering is very different than philosophy, right? So, um, but I do think there's two from teachers apart. Do you care about your student? Right? Do, you, do you care about students? Do you want them? inspired to learn or do you want them in your class just uh, come to your class just for the sake of getting grades so so i think that for as a teacher part you do want to see how do i inspire student student and that particularly inspire students heart and mind let them really uh, love this course and also love this profession in the long run so, but at the same time, I do think that all these years teaching, I'm really um, happy when I see students uh, um, asking me my quite ask me question. I said, "Come on, ask me a question, make me smart." Otherwise, I look like uh, right. So, so students' question make us smart, 
and it inspired us as well. So it's a mutual process. I was teaching for many years, and one of the things that I suppose I became to realize is as a teacher, I was responsible not just for the transmission, for what I was putting out there, but for the reception, for what was happening with the student. And I suppose the hard way of that was the first time I ever had to correct examination papers where there was an incentive for people to accurately repeat what you had said to them. And you realize that this was rather, it began by faulting them, the students, and then I realized, no, it's me, because I have enough understanding of the filters through which they're hearing, so you become more corrective. I think the other thing as a teacher, the great moment is you, you introduce people to a subject and you may get them fired up and interested in the subject, and they will come back afterwards and revisit the material and take it further and correct, in fact, what you were doing. So there's that openness to the process that you're learning together that I think is interesting. Um, um, this gentleman, sorry, this gentleman here. Thank you. So first, I want to like uh, put some comments to my two cents, and then I have a few questions. So <laughs> how about you made one question? Okay, Thank I will you. make one question. And first is, what is good education? I think it's effective and efficient. And we need good teachers. There is no bad student, right? And then we need teacher to match with the student. And then we need to have more information about the student, like the emotional and all the background, and we need more caring. We also need more in informative, like how he is learning. And then we can impose, like what, like we can do like adaptive learning, which is inspired from game. And there's a very good institute doing it. It's called 42 in the Bay Area. And I think the inspiration I have is that it's uh, it starts from easy, and then it slowly it goes to hard. It's adaptive, and then it visualizes the purpose and rewards. So the student has a control. He knows what he wants, and he can control. He knows how fast he should run. And it's also interactive, and yeah. So some, the fundamental thing is that we need more content. Can we let teachers to come to, to connect with teachers so that they can share their lectures, they can share what they're, how they are teaching, and how to modularize the knowledge. And my question is that, what is learning? Why do we need to learn? What should we learn? <laughs> so this is not the real question. The real question is, <laughs> after all these things, is how do we learn important? So a little bit background. My, my name is Dong Ming Jing. I am a PhD in astro astrophysics, and I'm now running a startup to trying to solve this. Um, well, first, I want to draw some boundaries. So I will say, I am a, if I am your teacher, but I'm not your mother. <laughs> so I can't know all about you. I don't want, really want to know about you either, right? So, so that drawing I say I do, I talk about the care, but it's intellectual care. So that's the one thing. Well, for your question about the learning, well, learning is a, a way of living. Do you want to live? So then you learn, right? So for Confucius has a saying, you, you learn, right? you're living, to the death, uh, or you live up to your death, uh, old age, and then you're learning up to your uh, old age. So same, so, so living self, life itself is a learning process. Thank you, there was a lady here. Um, so Hannah, may I, Can I, this lady here in the middle. Hi, my name is Katherine Harris, and I'm a professor at San Jose State University, which is a mere four miles away from here. And I do work in digital humanities and deep humanities. And I'm so glad that this was an open forum and that I could come and listen to you, because I was really struck by the optimism of the entire panel in the aspect of humanity and AI, and the sense that the theme become, is more about how to improve or evolve AI, uh, humanity in the face of AI. And I'm wondering if you can, s if all the panelists can see a thread about this optimism and where do we go from here, not just in education, but 
all over the world and thinking about our daily lives and our daily movements and how we can possibly teach those boundaries to our students of all sorts and ranks at all different kinds of universities? Uh, I'm not sure that we are optimistic. I mean, I think <laughs> pretty much over the past couple of days, we were all aware and, and worry about misuses. I mean, in a capitalist system, you know, the main danger is that AI would be used to increase profits of capitalists as opposed to helping majority of people, and, and that's serious risk in education as well. And you know, in, in China, there are different kinds of risks as well that were, that were pointed. It could, be, it, it could be used to promote more control and, and decrease creativity. So I, I'm not sure that we're optimistic. I mean, we, we are, but, it, but we have to think of what standards, we, all we can do is, as, you know, as, as intellectuals is, is provide more clarity about the standards we should employ to think of what counts as progress and regress, and whether we could persuade capitalists or government leaders, I mean, I'm not sure, you know? That, that's not our task, right? Could I, could I ask a, a follow-up um, and, and ask Paul, he, you, you mentioned that Catholic social thought and Pope Francis have not come to any definitive conclusions about AI, it's, uh, which is wise as it's an evolving topic. At the same time, the mixture of positive and negative, how do you, how do you see that in the, in the Pope's own thinking about artificial intelligence? And can you lay out for us some of the key issues that are being debated uh, in these circles about where the church should come down on these questions? Maybe if I go back to reflect on some of the early thinking that was done about digital culture in general and the emergence of digitization and um, social media and all of that sort of stuff. One of the things I think we were very the headline, the Vatican condemns, is too easy. And we have to avoid that. I think it, we have to avoid that automatic sense that we're somehow going to be on the negative. And it's a trying to um, understand, observe, get a better appreciation of what we're talking about. And I think for a lot of the stuff, some of what we're talking about, about artificial intelligence, there are real applications and development we can comment about. Some of it is highly speculative. And while it's interesting to speculate and it forces us to think through some of our categories, I think we would not want to be definitive on anything like that yet. I think the other thing we have to be very conscious of is that we're part of a tradition that recognizes that one of the gifts we have is we have a capacity for reason and to reflect. And as Antonio mentioned today, but Benedict had this notion that technology shows the capacity of the spirit, in a sense, to advance material, the material, that we, we live as human beings with that openness towards development. And I think we, we have to keep that alert. I think also that's important that if we come across as somehow negative on science, negative on technology, negative on all of that, then we won't be able to have the dialogue that will be necessary when we ask, well, to what purposes are we putting these developments is what seems to be progressive, really progressive, in terms of its benefits and what it produces for humanity. So, but I do think we have to be careful to keep, to appreciate um, the advances. I think anything that somehow adds more intelligence in the broadest sense to our human um, resources is to be welcomed. We then need to think through that more critically, what we mean by intelligence. And I think one of the interesting things is that all of this is making us do is reflect more critically on what it is to be human, what it is that is distinctively human that makes life worthwhile, and to become more critical about the processes we use. Thank you. Um, here, uh, Kirti, here. Um, Professor Kirti Kalyanam, I'm in the business school. Uh, I'm a marketing professor, so I'm responsible for studying social media, <laughs> these kind of very bad things. I have a more broader philosophical question. Um, as, as an economist, or partially trained as an economist, I see this as another technological revolution. And there have been other technological revolutions that we have faced, the steam engine, the electricity, locomotives, et cetera, et cetera. And even more devastating ones like the invention of nuclear technology and power. Uh, why is this different? And how is it different? And how did humanity cope with those changes? And were they good or were they bad? 
very broad question, but I appreciate any thoughts you have. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll offer, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, this is a key issue, right? Uh, whenever a new technology comes along, they're the doomsayers, the optimists, and somehow we, we adjust and the, the fundamental questions of what it means to be human aren't necessarily reposed or, or reformed. I think there's a difference though. Uh, you could track revolutions in information, communications, transportation technology over the last hundred years um, and you see a trend toward uh, greater communication across distance, uh, less time in face-to-face -face human interaction, but maybe we're at an inflection point where machines are becoming and will become so ubiquitous. Think about uh, virtual reality, uh, which is now in its very early stages, but is a technology which will allow people to immerse themselves uh, in real worlds, have real experiences that are not mediated by by person-to-person -person fleshly encounters. I mean, that is something radically new. We already see it with the gaming revolution. It's gonna go further. Uh, and a lot of those worlds will be generated by artificial intelligence, which is responding to our own preferences, desires, trying to shape our preferences and desires in ways that none of these earlier technologies could have. So that would be my sense of what is most revolutionary about this moment and what makes it different from the earlier revolutions. Can I yeah. add that very quickly? I think uh, um, last revolutions, China is not a part of it. But uh, today, this, revolu this uh, revolution, China is part of it. And uh, China in some ways leads the way. So we do need to understand um, China and also the world. Um, thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you to the panelists for a rich discussion. Um, I'm Mei Lin Chin. I'm in the philosophy department here at Santa Clara University, and so I too am going to give a philosophical question. Um, so uh, my question is directed towards Sorhun Tan and Robin Wong, and I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to how intelligence is construed in the Confucian and Taoist traditions, respectively, because one of the um, things that I heard coming out of this discussion is there's a sort of deep suspicion that AI will ever be able to really model human intelligence because it's algorithm based. And so something that's algorithm based is always going to be a little bit too automatic. As responsive as AI can be, it's still a little too automatic. But I also know that in both the Confucian and Taoist tradition, one of the aims of cultivation is a kind of automatic responsiveness, maybe in a more social way. Right, but there's a there's a kind of valorization of, of automaticity in a sense, and I was wondering if you could, because I know the question of what intelligence is in these two traditions is really broad, but maybe could you speak to the question of what intelligence is in terms of automaticity and skill? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so intelligence is very complicated. So you ask really big questions. So, but here I give you more specific uh, directly to answer because the time uh, is in the concern. So I think Taoist uh, intelligence, one way I can look at it called embodied wisdom. This embodied wisdom, what does that it is? What does what it look like? How do you manifest it? This is, will be one of, uh, uh, it's called a uh, uh, territory, the riding horses. Riding horses is a, one of a, Chinese classical liberal education. Because riding horse, you have a many different uh, circumstances, the, the, the weather, the terrain, and the horse's temperament, and the your goal, and the your, uh, emotional, um, your emotional makeups. So in this thing, you need to um, navigate all this uh, elements of working the, together and then finish your journey. Because a horse has a, a temperament. You want the horse go fast, they go slow. You want to go slow, then you go fast, right? You also have a goal. And also you have your own uh, emotional you know, uh, state of being. So intelligence will manifest in this horse riding. And that is if you can efficiently doing so, 
and then they will, I will see this person possess this embodied uh, wisdom. This is how uh, Taoists think about the intelligence. And uh, then I will say, use another word to say, maybe it's art of adaptivity. I think intelligence as a concept is a fairly uh, modern kind of understanding. So then for AI, the intelligence that they are talking about is our modern understanding of intelligence. But if you look at the, the ancient traditions, right? I mean, for Confucians, the, the, I think we can retrospectively see a distinction between knowledge and wisdom. And what they're interested in is wisdom. So you know what is now uh, the term that is usually translated as uh, knowledge or even intelligence, right? Zi or zi. Right, in the ancient, in the, in the classical language, right, certainly for the Confucians, uh, it's not knowledge in the sense of propositional knowledge. Right? It's actually a virtue. And what does it mean for it to be a virtue? Of course, you might think that then this is a virtue in the sense of maybe Phronesis or Sophia and all that. But I think it's a virtue. What's, what needs emphasizing here is that as a virtue, it's, it's much more about uh, judgment than about reasoning, right? Because reasoning, certainly, if you think that reasoning can be turned into an algorithm, you're thinking about a reasoning where logic is very important. It's basically logical reasoning, right? There has to be some kind of logic to it. But the kind of um, thinking or the kind of virtue, right, that constitutes zi for the Confucians, uh, is not logic-based. It's actually a kind of valorized and valorizing perception and also judgment, right? a kind of virtuous judgment. Right? So if that's the case, it's not so much automaticity. Right? I would rather call it a kind of spontaneous efficacy. In any kind of situation, you can, not just through your logical mind, but actually all the whatever um, perceptual, and um, perhaps there's also some intuitive um, uh, process going on, it means whatever it is that you are receiving from the environment, from what you observe from um, other kinds of moral sense or moral sensibility, um, you can make a decision of, or, or you, you can respond through action that is completely appropriate, right? So, but this process, right, this uh, reception, uh, recept reception or moral sensing and response uh, has very little to do with logic. You can't turn it into a set of logical rules and say that if you were to apply these logical rules, you can behave as virtuously as the sage. Right at the back. Uh, thank you for that very rich conversation. Uh, I'm also from San Jose State, uh, from the literature department, and my colleague uh, asked the question about optimism earlier on. Uh, so I just wanted to share with you all, we uh, actually at San Jose State organized a symposium on deep humanities and uh, AI last year using the Frankenstein novel as a kind of a springboard. And uh, when discussing the novel, usually the discussions around uh, AI center around questions about uh, human-centered design, human rights approaches, and so on. But the novel sort of pushed us to ask questions about uh, what about the rights of the creature, of the AI machine? Uh, what kind of ethical responsibilities will we owe to the creature that we create? And the comment earlier made about maybe we should create ugly robots that we can hate. Uh, the whole novel is really about the creature asking for love from his creator. And the refusal of that love turns him into a monster. So in the light of the discussion around rethinking the human in more dispersed, more relational uh, ways, how would you all respond to this question of what, what, what obligations and ethical responsibilities would we have to an AI creature that we create? Um, yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that we should hate the ugly robots. I just mean to say that we should design robots that <laughs> do the work efficiently, but that won't lead you know, elderly parents to become too attached to them. Um, but I don't quite see that there's any rights or obligations that we owe to AI as it stands now, unless AI develops feelings or consciousness. I mean, they're just tools. The same, this, just like, you know, we, we, I don't owe any obligation to this bottle of water or to a kind of hammer. I mean, they're there to serve us. That's it, you know? I mean, we shouldn't, um, it's bad maybe if I like take a 
you know, a, a chair and just smash it, but it reflects badly on me, but it's not because I, I owe obligations to, to the chair, right? I mean, maybe I'm missing something. We have time for one more question. I'd like to yield this question to a student, uh, since we are a university. Um, so, if you're there. Good. Hi, thank you. My name is Julian Dryman. I'm a sophomore here. Um, Professor Bell, when you asked at the beginning of the talk, do we want to see a future where we don't have to have hard work or strenuous labor? I raised my hand, too, as many of my, us in this room did. But I wonder, to the panel, reflecting on your faith traditions and what you study, is, there, is it possible to, for AI to make life too easy? When, you, know, you said that Confucianism is about personhood and how personhood must be created. Is it possible that if we make life too easy, then are we losing part of our personhood in that struggle? Mm -hmm. I should say that's, that's an excellent question. We talked about it at some length. It's a, it's a fascinating question. Who'd like to, to jump in on that? I don't yeah. think oh, yeah. it's a question of making life too easy because what Daniel is talking about is all those boring, repetitive. In some ways, uh, what Marx is talking about is the kind of dehumanizing labor, right? The kind of labor that results in alienation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but in the utopia that he's talking about, I don't think it needs to be one where hard work is no longer present, but it's hard work that you voluntarily engage in because it's hard work that actually develops your humanity, right? And Confucians will certainly say, well, you know, you still have to cultivate yourself and cultivating yourself is very hard work, okay? Uh, but it's work that you cannot try to avoid. And a lot of this hard work has to do with improving your relationship uh, with people, okay? As someone in our discussion also say, one of the attraction of, um, iPhones, gadgets, you know, using all this, whether it's virtual reality or just communicating with people through this mediation of technology so that you don't have to hear their nagging or, you know, see their unhappy faces. Now, all these things, Confucians will say, uh, you can't avoid. It is hard work. It is sometimes very unpleasant uh, learning process that you go through. Uh, but it's absolutely crucial to self-cultivation and becoming uh, the human person that you are meant to be. I think uh, um, it's not a matter of, let's say, make life easy. Rather, if lost the ability, if you lost the human ability, then Taoism, Taoist perspective will question about this. Because there is certain hu human ability and uh, we need to preserve, cultivate, and for example, curiosity. If you, if you, you, because you have AI help you everything, and then you lost the basic uh, curiosity about the world, and then you're not living in this world, then that's a problem. So, so yeah. we want protecting human ability. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, think of um, GPS. I mean, it makes life easier, which is good. But on the other hand, if it means that young people lose a sense of orientation that their, their elders have, that's not necessarily a, a good thing either, right? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was reluctant to put my hand up to the utopian. I think <laughs> I had remembrance of a bad episode of Star Trek where they arrive in this perfect planet and suddenly it's not quite as, but on a more serious level, I think. I think, as I begin more critical about it, I probably don't have to do most of the time the hard and dangerous manual type works that could be abolished. Um, but I, I think the kind of work that we might be opening up towards Pete to be more creative, to be more um, engaging into, is also requires effort. So therefore, I don't think effort disappears, but maybe some of the drudgery, and I think that's one of the things that, when I've been thinking about some of the work that will be displaced, some of that work is dangerous, some of that work is so the person is drawing on so such a, they're not drawing on their full humanity in that. So I think we do need, I mean, I think work is also, and I think this is where it's, it's important that we have some sort of a, work is not just what produces economic benefit for me, it's where I find my identity, it's where I socialize. So, and I think that we'll, we'll be thinking of context, but I think struggle is what makes life, there's, it's achievement, it's struggle. There's a, another literary reference here is uh, Julian Barnes, British novelist, 
final chapter of a history of the world in ten and a half chapters is this ideal world where everything starts is going right, but everybody it's boredom before long. We need challenge. We need exit. Yeah. Um, gentlemen and ladies, um, I'd like you to join me in, in congratulating and thanking our panelists. To my calculations, they represent at least five, four different time zones. So uh, <laughs> this has um, been done with heroic effort, uh, uh, working against jet lag. Um, so a couple of um, and things to say that this is very much an ongoing conversation. Um, I'm conscious that there were a number of questions which did not get asked. I'm sorry we didn't have time to do that, but they can be asked of our not only of our panelists but also of the other participants in the seminar. We will all be um, going out to the lobby there for the reception. Please do join us. Introduce, please introduce yourself to somebody you don't know. Um, and then finally, since we're coming to the end of church, um, here are some announcements. Um, <laughs> Tech and the human spirit is an evolving endeavor. Uh, we deal with all dimensions of the human person, including the spiritual. The next installation of our series, you won't have to wait very long for. It's actually on Monday uh, at 4 o'clock at the Disassay Museum. Father Antonio Spadaro is our Bannon, giving our Bannon lecture. And his uh, title is Cyber Theology thinking faith in the digital age, you can register on www.scu.edu slash THS. Um, there you will also find our theater on our updates on our tech and the human spirit. And finally, please read the lead essay in the April issue of the Santa Clara magazine. It's called Technology, Wonder, and Us. It's a very good essay, and I wrote it. <laughs> So please join me once again in thanking all our panelists.